an abstract that I wrote. It's talking about improvements in sensitivity of something like 11 orders of magnitude. Um, I'll talk mostly about developments during the last 20 years because that's what I know about because I wasn't doing it before that. Uh, but this is kind of an example of the 11 orders of magnitude. Uh, this is uh, the reaction used for the discovery of curium. It had a cross section of about 10 millibar and so the half life for curium 242 is, is 18 years. That's what we have. No. Yeah. 162 days. days. 244 is 18 years. <coughs> and, uh, and, and also a neutron capture to make a uh, and some 241 here. Uh, cross section 300 barns. Today's experiments, this is for super heavy elements cross sections are on the order of a pico barn. So you see there's something, I mean, between here and here there's 10 orders of magnitude. So the sensitivities of these experiments have really increased. And uh, I want to show how and why. Uh, so the first part will be about online separators. Uh, this is a curve, uh, something, part of the curve that Matthias already showed. This is how I'm measuring uh, sensitivity. The, the two things, two of the main things that we're working against are cross sections, which are related to the production rates for these heavy elements, and the half-life. As it gets shorter, typically it becomes more difficult, but there are things that come in at the, at the long uh, half-life end that makes things more difficult also. I'm going to be juggling uh, slides around here a little bit. So 20 years ago, uh, that was the curve that I had at the, at the, on, on here in green, taken from those uh, super heavy element experiments in 1982. I kind of combined the curves from both the SHIP and SASE. Uh, okay, the microsecond range at the short end, I need two projectors here, uh, are really limited by flight time through the separator, it's about a microsecond, and also the pulse processing electronics. As you get into the half-life range between milliseconds and minutes, okay, this is a flat part of the curve, and it's limited by uh, production rates, cross-sections, and efficiencies of the separator. As you get to longer lifetimes, there's a reduction in the sensitivity. Basically, anything above the curve is an experiment you can do. Anything below the curve, you can't do. Uh, there's a reduction in sensitivity here uh, because of background rates. The way these experiments work is you have a separator. You produce the thing in a nuclear reaction. The compound nucleus products will recoil out of the target with the momentum of the beam and fly through the separator. They implant in the detector. You detect that, and then you watch that position in the detector. Uh, for the subsequent decay. If the half-life between the implantation and the decay is long, then background events come and compete and, and makes it difficult to detect. When you get to very long half-lives, longer than the length of the experiment, uh, then you have the possibility to count the detectors for long-lived decays after the experiment's over. The background rates are again very low, so the sensitivity increases again until you get to the point where, okay, you can only count the detector for a limited amount of time before you have to use it for another experiment. Um, I think it was a little bit disappointing during those super heavy element experiments to have a sensitivity only uh, a little bit better than a nano barn. Uh, in today's uh, experiments, okay, uh, the blue line shows pretty much the uh, sensitivity from the Berkeley gas field separator the shift velocity filter at GSI, and also the gas field separator at Dubna. Uh, what you see is uh, two or three orders of magnitude increase to this part of the curve. Uh, much of that is due to higher beam intensities and better efficiencies in the separators. Uh, we had Sigurd Hoffman a few years ago come over to Berkeley and tell us about these improvements that were made at the GSI Unilag between the discovery of element 109 and the discovery of element 110, which Darlene showed there was a gap of about 10 years there. It was really impressive because there were a large number of 20% improvements in efficiency or uh, throughput in the experiment, and it really totaled to a couple orders of magnitude uh, in sensitivity. Uh, I showed three dots on here. Uh, the first one, I don't know if it's the first one, let me see. Okay, with GSI, uh, okay, first, first of all, this was kind of the sensitivity of experiments during the time of element 107 before they made uh, a lot of the improvements with the velocity filter shift. I think the improvements they made was uh, increasing the angular acceptance by replacing these quadrupoles. They added another magnet here uh, at the end of the separator to help with the rejection and uh, I think the detect detection system. 
is, is that much better. Uh, and one of the recent experiments they've done there is the discovery of element 112, which you can see is pretty near the limit, uh, at least the way I've calculated, of the sensitivity. Also here, in the longer half-life range, pretty really bordering on the edge of where the sensitivity starts to decrease again, is the element 114 experiment. That's one of the results uh, from the 114 and 116 experiments from Dubna with the gas filled separator. This separator is actually very similar uh, to the SASE separator used uh, on the green curve uh, at Berkeley. Uh, they've made big improvements. Uh, a lot of it is because they, at Dubna they have uh, the availability of large blocks of high intensity beam time. Um, uh, and also, uh, they've done a good job with the detection system and getting the background rates uh, low enough to where they're sensitive to detection of things at production rates of something like one atom per month. Okay, one more uh, dot on there is the element 118 experiment we did with the BGS at Berkeley. I don't remember what I was going to say about that, but this is the little picture we've uh, kind of redone the gas filled separator. Uh, built a larger acceptance device with a larger angle, it gives better separation uh, and reduction of background. Um, and so uh, that's kind of this, I think, I, I would say this is the state of the art uh, right now for separators. And I draw finally a red curve on here. This is future online separators. And what I've done is, uh, you know, we're thinking things like using superconducting magnets in, in a separator to reduce the overall size, it reduces the flight time through here. Also using fast pulse processing electronics, we should be able to see half-lives uh, of online uh, pulse shape processing. We should be able to see half-lives down in the, in the sub-microsecond region. Uh, the curve comes lower. I'm thinking, in this case, I'm thinking about higher intensity beams from uh, accelerators. We're thinking of, uh, about the GSI intensity upgrade. Uh, in Berkeley, uh, pretty much we're thinking about uh, in a year from now, we should have a superconducting ECR uh, injector to the Cygotron online that will increase beam intensities. And if we can get the beam time and have the patience, I think we can get down into this type of sensitivity range. And also being optimistic, I've removed this little uh, thing here saying we can bring the background rates down low enough to where we don't have this reduction in sensitivity in the minutes range. Okay. Matthias already showed uh, some of these cross-section versus half-life sensitivity plots. Now I want to talk about the sensitivity of different chemical systems. Uh, and I have five curves on here with a representative experiment from each. The first one is in green that I called dissolve, dissolve the target chemistry. Uh, this was the way they were doing things even 40 years ago. Uh, Darlene already showed you uh, the picture of our wall doing dissolve the target chemistry. I especially like the, uh, the safety equipment in use at the time. That's, That's McMillan? That's yeah. McMillan. Okay, it's McMillan, sorry. Uh, I, I, speci I especially like the safety equipment used at the time. Yeah. Now we would have to do this kind of stuff in a glove box, and, and uh, it, it would look a little bit different. Uh, OK, that's characterized by high intensity light ion beams. And because they were using light ion beams with a low uh, DE, DX as it passes through the target, they were able to use thick targets to cover the full broad excitation function. However, they had to dissolve this target, which was actually, in many cases, a large amount of radioactivity, and there, therefore had to do com complicated uh, chemical separations, which took up to hours. Uh, and typically, these experiments would be a single irradiation separation and counting cycle. And so if I go back to this thing, uh, an example, uh, I think this was supposed to be the curium-242, the cross-section is way up here somewhere, but you can see uh, the sensitivity of the technique really does come down here to the 100 nanobar level. Those experiments were with long half-lives where uh, detection is somewhat of a problem. The next curve I'd like to talk about is a blue curve. This is the recoil catcher foil technique. And the idea there is you don't always want to have to dissolve the target. Uh, first of all, it's slow and gets uh, complicated chemistry. Uh, uh, and also, then you can only use your targets once before you have to rebuild the target. So uh, an idea, I think this is from Al Giorso, is okay, let's again take advantage of the uh, momentum imparted to the compound nucleus 
uh, in a nuclear reaction, let it recoil out of a thin target into a catcher foil. And then at the end of an irradiation, we can remove the catcher foil and perform chemistry. Uh, so thin targets uh, are limited by the range, uh, the recoil range of the products. You can do a simpler chemistry uh, because the catcher foil has lower radioactivity. And because you're not dissolving the target, you can do tens of irradiations to build up statistics. As, and as an example there, I think I even have a picture. Uh, we did some experiments uh, using kind of an odd uh, reaction to make lorentium-262 with a sub-nanobarn cross-section. It's got a half-life of a few hours. Uh, and here's a nice uh, slow, slow chemistry picture. This, this shows a, a, a target system. The target mounts in, in this block, slides in there, and the catcher foil hangs in this. Uh, ignore those for now. The catcher foil hangs in this rack right beneath it to catch the products that come through the target. And this is a, a nice leisurely column chromatography apparatus for doing chemistry on a kind of a one hour time scale. We could do these things actually down to about 10 or 15 minutes if we included uh, chemistry reaction time in the truck between the cyclotron and the chemistry laboratory. Okay, the next big improvement I have on the, the red curve here, and that was uh, to use a gas jet to deliver the activity. Uh, again, uh, Dissolving the catcher foil uh, was a slow part of the chemistry. We typically had a gold catcher foil. We had to dissolve it in uh, a good, uh, maybe a milliliter of solution to remove the gold before even starting the chemistry. Uh, with a gas jet, the idea is the products, again, recoil out of the target. They're stopped in a high-pressure gas that's been seeded with aerosols. And then they can be transported on those aerosols through a capillary to uh, the chemistry area. And uh, again, we're, uh, we're limited to thin targets because the products have to recoil out. But now we can do very simple chemistry. We don't have, uh, as, for example, a gold foil to get rid of anymore. The aerosols are something very simple like potassium chloride. It doesn't interfere with the chemistry. Since we can do chemistry on a one minute time scale now, even manually, liquid liquid extractions, we can do hundreds of irradiations to build up statistics. And as an example, uh, I show on here some of the things that uh, dubnium-262, cross-section of a few nanobars in a, in a half-life of half a minute, uh, we were able to study the chemical properties with that. Oh, and this is one of my, this is a fun picture to show of how this uh, manual chemistry goes with the gas jet. Uh, the gas jet is delivered, uh, comes up through the bottom of the hood from the irradiation facility, which is down below. It's collected on this uh, four position wheel, and we just uh, can pick it up with a syringe. Uh, we were doing micro scale liquid liquid extractions. Uh, the phases were so small they didn't mix very well, so we used an ultrasonic humidifier that we tore apart to mix the phases. A small toy centrifuge to uh, re separate them, then we would pipette off the top phase, dry it on a hot plate, and, and put it on the detector. But I like this picture because it's got the boss, it's got the young staff scientist, it's got the graduate student all smiling for the camera. It's got the postdoc doing all the work. <laughs> that's, that's Andy. That's Andy and Grace Turtler. Yeah. Okay. And then we moved over to uh, some automated or, yeah, automated systems. Uh, okay, so in the pink, and I think that was supposed to be magenta, but it, we got another page somewhere. I want this one. Yes, the pink curve. Uh, we heard about already from Matthias. Uh, a gas jet transport to an automated um, aqueous chemistry. And there I'm talking pretty much about the ARCA. Uh, the first three points are about the same. The chemistry is somewhat faster. We're getting samples onto the detectors after about 30 seconds. Can be repeated about every 45 seconds, uh, right? And, and we can do thousands now of irradiations, irradiation separation, and counting cycles to build up statistics. Uh, the present systems, ARCA, is very labor intensive, but it gives sensitivity down to the sub nanobarn region. This is the 265 Seborgium experiment that was done a few years ago. Um, about that. Uh, okay, and finally, oh, I have a picture. I don't, did you show a picture? 
No, no. No. Well, this is this is the one I, I grabbed off the web because I was.